<laughs> yeah, so welcome again, uh, Greg and Anna. We are excited to to learn about how we're going to build a lightsaber. I'm a I'm a Star Wars fan, and I'm really I'm really interested about what did you do actually. So maybe you give us again a quick introduction about yourself, and then. Uh, Take us deep into the um, uh, secrets of getting the Kuiper crystals into a functioning lightsaber. Yep, cool. Thanks, thanks, guys. See you. Had to, um, <laughs> had to be back again. Um, all right. Well, I'm gonna get started straight away because uh, it's part of the intro and part of the talk. I kind of planned this whole thing, so. About last year this time, my husband asked me what I'd like for my birthday. And at the time, we were watching a lot of And he just laughed and we carried on doing what we were doing, probably watching more Clone Wars. And I was busy thinking this, processing what I had just said and I paused, I paused the show and I said to him, no, wait, you can't just buy me a lightsaber. A real Jedi has to build their own lightsaber from scratch, from nothing. And he looked at me and said, so want to build a lightsaber. And that's what I did. So my young Padawans, thank you for coming to my talk today. And I will show you today how I built this lightsaber. But before I do that, for, in order for you to tr trust me as your master Jedi, I have to tell you a little bit more about myself. So my name is Gilgana, but I usually go by Jerry because that's a little bit easier to pronounce. You can find me on Twitter at JerryBBG or on my website, gilgana.dev. Lucky for me, I have a strange enough name that I could get a .dev website quite easily. I work for a company called Cora, and I am a Microsoft MVP. I'm a Microsoft MVP in Windows development because of my contributions to IoT. And this all started with me wanting to control my droid with the Force, because every Jedi needs a trusty droid to go on adventures with. And now I know what you might be thinking. You're probably thinking this lady is crazy. The force is not real. We live Wars. in the real world, not in Star Wars. But you would be wrong. You just know it by a different name. It's called JavaScript. So lightsabers. <laughs> Lucky for me, I have a very talented friend who 3D printed and painted the lightsaber hilt for me. This process that you're watching right now took about three days to complete the 3D print. And that does not include all of the reprints we had to do because of broken pieces and unmeasured things and so on and so forth. But we got the model online. It was created by a 3D designer who does this kind of thing for, they, uh, they actually did it for a 3D printing model as an ad advertisement. And we downloaded the models, printed everything. The process that you're watching of the sanding, cleaning, painting, that took about eight hours. The lightsaber hilt itself is modeled after Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber. And it consists of 14 pieces, all building up to this one thing. And the pieces inside are actually hollow, so we could fit all of the, you know, kyber crystals. Um, there is a little button to turn the lightsaber on and off. The blade is detachable because the first time I did this talk, I had to fly with the lightsaber to Cape Town. And I was a bit worried about putting it on an airplane, just like I was worried about coming to Mauritius with it originally, because I thought they might think it was a weapon, but I think they thought it was Christmas lights. <laughs> so <laughs> it was okay. Um, so that's why the blade is detachable. So it's easier to fit inside a suitcase. 
and as cool as Ray in The Force Awakens, my lightsaber also has a screw holding it all together. But now that's the outside of the lightsaber. What about the inside? Well, the inside of a lightsaber is made from a kyber crystal. In the peak of the Jedi Order, young Padawans, such as yourselves, would be sent to remote planets around the universe to mine for their own kyber crystals so that they could build their lightsabers. But now, unfortunately for us, we live in a slightly more boring world than the Star Wars universe, so kyber crystals aren't in fact real. But luckily for us, we have two things that can help us make our kyber crystal. The first is the Internet of Things, and the second is JavaScript. So I had two attempts at making my own kyber crystal. The first, I used something called a Nordic Thingy 52. Now, I'm not calling it a thingy because I've forgotten its name. That is its real name, I promise. And the reason I decided to use it is because it's a simple prototyping kit that you can use quite easily. And it had all of the things that our lightsaber would need. It had an LED for the lights. Of course, it's in the name. A speaker for the zoom zoom sounds. A button, or also known as a dead Jedi switch, because for those of you who know Star Wars, you might know that every time a Jedi drops their lightsaber, it turns off automatically. And an accelerometer to help us make those zoom zoom sounds when the lightsaber moves. And one of the other things that the Nordic thingy has is Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth is probably my favorite wireless technology. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But the reason I wanted it to have some sort of wireless technology is so that we could connect it to the internet and make it a real smart lightsaber. But I encountered a problem. I built this thing using the Nordic thingy, but then I couldn't fit this block inside the cylinder. So I had to move on. The other problem with the Nordic thingy is that the light, the LED on it is not actually that bright. And we really want our lightsaber to be very bright. So I decided to try something else. Pi Zero. Raspberry Pi Zero is a little computer, very similar to the Raspberry Pi, just a lot smaller. It runs with something called uh, Debian Buster Lite. So it's a light version of Linux, which is command line only. So you don't need to plug it into a screen or anything. You just set up the SSH and SSH straight into it. That takes a little bit of setup, but there is a number of blog posts you can follow on that. And I have some links on my website for and on my GitHub for all of the things I followed in order to get this thing working. Then the first step to get the light look like a real lightsaber was to add lights. And I would wanted to use a set of lights so that the, the lightsaber would look bright and like a real lightsaber. And for that, I used a LED strip. The LED strip gets connected to the serial peripheral interface of the Raspberry Pi. Now, this is similar to a GPI open, but slightly more special. It works on a very high frequency so that it gives the lightsaber this effect as if it's glowing the whole time. And it also gives us the possibility of making the lightsaber look like it's turning on and switching off in a wave almost. Now, there's a lot of tutorials online about how to connect the Raspberry Pi Zero to one of these LED strips. And one thing I learned while reading these tutorials is that you should not always trust what you read on the internet. Because Sometimes you get some bad things that happen. But 
one thing that all the tutorials had was that the Raspberry Pi Zero itself does not provide enough amps in order to turn on the LEDs and make them very bright. Because each LED needs 30 milliamps, which means we have 45 LEDs or so, and that's a lot of amps. It will give you a bit of a shock if you were to if it were to go through you. That's how one of my engineer uh, engineer friends explained it to me. And the uh, Pi Zero, being a small device, does not provide those amps. So you had to have an external power for the LEDs. So I decided, okay, I would listen to this. Let's connect it up to external power. I took an old USB cable that I found at home, cut it in half, connected everything to the LED strip. At this time, I was still prototyping on a breadboard, and suddenly I could smell smoke. I had no idea what was going on. I was freaking out. So I quickly unplugged everything, and I started picking things up to figure out what was happening. Lucky for me, I only lost one jumper wire, but it had melted completely, and that's what, where the smoke was coming from. So I started digging into this. Why was this happening? I got a multimeter, and eventually I found out. You know how we have these standards in electronics where the live wire is usually the red wire and the neutral or ground, the other wire, is usually black or brown or white, not, not red. Well, my USB cable was not meant to be cut in half. The wires were switched around and it did not go well. Anyway, so at this point, I decided I'm not going to listen to the internet anymore and try just plugging it in directly into the Raspberry Pi. And it was supposed to work. I had followed all of the rules. I tried so many different things, but the lights were just not turning on. So I was looking, I was reading, and eventually I ended up on Wikipedia again, reading about what an LED is. LED is a light emitting diode, which when current travels through it, it produces light. And then I was looking at the symbol for an LED in a circuit. That's what it looks like. It's a little triangle. Now that triangle is not there just for prettiness. That triangle actually points in the direction of which the current needs to flow. Because an LED only produces light if you put current through it in the correct direction. So I took a closer look at my LED strip. This is a very close up of my LED strip. And I think you may have spotted it already, but there is an arrow right there. And my wires were connected to the wrong end of that arrow. So I soldered the wires onto the correct end of the <laughs> LED strip and I was very happy at this point in time, although I think I got a lot of gray hairs from this LED strip. Anyway, so now that we had lights, everything was good. We had an actual lightsaber. We could move on to the sound. Now, the Raspberry Pi Zero itself does not have a sound card, but it does have an HDMI port, which means it can produce sound. So you have to buy this external sound card to connect to it so you can so you can get get the sound without having to connect to HDMI. And this part works relatively easily. It comes with some drivers that you have to install on uh, USSH into the Raspberry Pi, plug it in, it fits nicely exactly on top of the Raspberry Pi, it's the exact same size, and the sound just works. The one thing that I want you to remember about the sound card is that the way the Raspberry Pi Zero creates sound is by taking a normal GPI open and converting it into a pulse width modulation pin. 
And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. But the sound was relatively easy to get working. Then there's the button, the on-off switch, the dead Jedi, the dead Jedi switch. It, buttons are relatively simple. It's a one or a zero. It's on or it's off. The circuit is either closed or it's open, right? Seems easy enough. And the general purpose input output Raspberry Pi are exactly that. That's what they do. So you can pick pretty much any of the green GPI opens that you see over there and connect it up. And there's a whole range of different on off libraries in JavaScript, Python, C, whichever language you prefer, you can use to control this kind of thing. Now, the problem came in when, remember I told you that the PWM pin is also a GPI open. And what the sound drivers do is they take that GPI open, that special GPI open, and convert it into a PWM pin so that you can play sound. But now what appears to happen is that some GPI opens, which are not marked as pulse width modulation pins, also act as pulse width modulation pins. So when you try to use them as the button, the GPIO then overrides the PWM and the button works, but the sound no longer works, <laughs> which is very, very strange. So pretty much how I found this out was by trial and error. I had the button plugged into one of these, which it just didn't like. It, every time I turn on the button, no matter what library I was using, the sound would break. And then I'd have to restart the Raspberry Pi in order to get it fixed. And that takes a little bit of time because these Pis have quite small processes. So rebooting takes a couple of minutes. But eventually I figured out that it was just the pin that I was using. And then the last part, the accelerometer. This part was really, honestly, the easiest part of this whole lightsaber. The accelerometer needs to be plugged in braided circuit. And there are only two pins like that. They are marked exactly. Their names are exact on the accelerometer itself and on the Raspberry Pi, this one, you really can't mess up. There's nothing that can break it. Now, now that we have all of our electronics together working nicely, we want to make this into a smart lightsaber. So for this, we're going to use Bluetooth. Now, the reason I chose Bluetooth is because Bluetooth is my favorite wireless technology. It's a little bit different to other wireless technologies. It's in a way, slightly dodgy wireless technology because it's supposed to work a certain way. And 95% of the time, it does work the way you expect it to. But there are so many things that affect it. Things like walls, and things like going around the corner of your house. Uh, it's just doesn't always work as, as you would expect it to work, but it's still fun to play with. And a few of my other talks are about web Bluetooth and connecting the web to Bluetooth devices. So you'll see later in the actual demo that I actually used web Bluetooth for this as well. It's quite a lot of fun to play with. And in order to make our lightsaber into a Bluetooth device, we need to understand a bit more about how Bluetooth works. So let me explain that. So there are two types of Bluetooth devices, central and peripheral. A central device is something like your laptop or your phone. This is the device that is the controlling device in the Bluetooth connection. It's the one that initiates a connection to the peripheral. It's the one that scans for Bluetooth devices and the one that maintains the connection and keeps it going. 
On the other hand, we have the peripheral, which in most cases would be something like a heart rate monitor, headphones, something like that. In our case, it is our lightsaber. This device is the, I would, I'd like to say dumber of the two, <laughs> because it doesn't actually do anything except for send information to the central device and receive information from the central device and then execute it on the device itself. So we're going to be building a peripheral device. A peripheral device consists firstly of something called a GAT profile or generic attribute profile. This, the generic attributes are a hierarchical data structure which explain how Bluetooth devices connect to each other and how they send data to each other. So the profile it says itself defines the whole device. Inside this profile, we have something called services. These services are the behaviors of the device. So if we were talking about, for example, a heart rate monitor, a heart rate monitor would have a heart rate service. The services then consist of connections to other services on the device, as well as characteristics. Now, characteristics are the actual functions itself. So again, with a heart rate monitor example, a, a heart rate characteristic would be the thing that measures your heart rate. There are three properties that a characteristic can have. A right characteristic is one that receives data from a central device and does something with that data. A read characteristic is one that sends data to the central device when the central device requests it. And a notify characteristic is one that continuously notifies the central device of something happening. Now, one thing that's interesting about Bluetooth compared to other wireless technologies is that with the notify, it will not continue to notify or to send this data if there is no longer something listening. So as soon as the central device disconnects from the peripheral, the peripheral stops sending that data. So in order to accomplish this on the lightsaber, I used a library called Blino or BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy for Node. It's a JavaScript library installed via NPM. And I learned something interesting about Linux. Now, I know a lot of people who use Linux on a daily basis already know this. But so in order to control the peripherals of a Raspberry Pi, you usually have to run the scripts that you're running using sudo, have to run as a super user. But most libraries, NPM libraries, suggest that when you're installing them on your Linux machine, that you do not use sudo to install them. But when you install in a node with sudo or NPM with sudo, and when you install NPM without sudo, they, it forms two different things on your Linux machine. So you have two different versions of the same library, one installed with sudo, one installed without. And I had to revert my Blino library to an earlier version because there was a bug. And because of that, I reverted the non-sudo one and then it wasn't working. And so that took another couple of days to figure out. But yeah, so when dealing with peripherals, with uh, small devices where you need to control the actual pins, then just do everything with sudo. That would be my suggestion there. So we're going to be building two characteristics in uh, using Blino. The first would be the write for the light. So we want to send data from the central device to the lightsaber to tell it what color to change. Now, at this point in time, I'm going to ask that all of you listening online 
start voting for a color. And at the end, I'm going to ask my hosts to tell me which color was the most popular and we can make that lightsaber that color. All right, so that's the right characteristic. And then we have the notify characteristic, which will keep track of whether the button is pushed or not, so that we know whether the lightsaber is on or not. So let's get started. We're going to dig into some JavaScript code over here. First thing we're going to do is build that right characteristic for the LED. We start by creating a light characteristic class that extends the Blino characteristic class. We set a universally unique identifier. Every characteristic and every service in Bluetooth Low Energy has to have one of these. They're usually defined by 128-bit chars, but some more common ones are actually just defined by a string name. So one of the ones I keep using is the heart rate. And the reason they use the string name like that is because no matter what heart rate monitor you have, what brand it is or, uh, or whatever, you can connect to it via any app that on your phone that's made to connect to heart rate monitors. That's why they use the common ones. So our light characteristic has the property right because we will be receiving information for the light. Then on a right characteristic, we need to override the method on right request. In this method, we can then read the data. The data comes in, to, in with a buffer, so all data in Bluetooth is sent with buffers, and we can read it as an unsigned integer array. Have to convert everything to unsigned integer arrays, and we read the red, green, and blue value so that we can set the color of our RGB LED strip. Then one thing important here is this callback at the end. So when you call the right characteristic from the central device, we need to have this callback so that the peripheral device can let the central device know that it's done executing this right characteristic and it can carry on. Or sometimes it's not done and sometimes an error occurs and you can send that error. So that's our LED. What about the button? Well, that will be a notify characteristic. Similarly, we extend the Blino characteristic class we set the universally unique identifier and set the property to notify. You can have multiple properties, so you can have the same characteristic doing multiple different things. This one is a bit more complex. There's a few extra things we have to do here. The first thing is we have to subscribe. So when the central device subscribes to the notify characteristic, we save this update, update value callback so we know that there's a central device listening. And then when it unsubscribes, we unset it so that we no longer send that information. And then the last one is the sending of the notification. So if we have this update value callback, we take the value, which in our case is just going to be a one or a zero based on whether the button is on or off, turn it into a buffer, and then we write that to the callback. Then there are two more methods inside the notify characteristic. A start method, which just uses a set interval in JavaScript, where every half a second, it checks if the button's state has changed. So has it turned on or off when it was the other one previously? and then calls that send notification. And a stop, which clears the interval and set, resets everything back to normal. So that's our two characteristics. Now, in order to make those characteristics accessible, we have to wrap them in a service. If you remember earlier, I said there can be one or more services. 
In this case, we're just going to use one primary service because our light and button characteristics are relatively similar. The way you're supposed to group your services is based on similarities. So we're going to have a service which does input and output. To create our service, we first initialize an instance of each of our characteristics. Now I know the last one, uh, there's three in there, and I said there's only two, but the last one is called surprise for a reason. And then we need to start the notify characteristic so that it starts looking for a subscription by a central device. And then we create the service. We do this using Blino's primary service method. We give the primary service a universally unique identifier as well, and we give it the three characteristics in an array. Then using set service, we start it up. And I've added a console.log in there just in case something goes wrong so we can see if there's an error along the way. All right. Now we have our service. Last thing we need to do is create our profile. In order to create our profile, we need to listen to two events. The first event is the on state changed event. The state we actually care about is the powered on. So has the device been turned on? If when the device gets turned on or when the script starts running, that's when we know that we need to create this Bluetooth profile. So we start advertising. We give our Bluetooth device a name, Lightsaber. This name is the name that you would see if you were in the same room with me currently and you started searching for Bluetooth devices. You would see a lightsaber in your list of Bluetooth devices around you. We give it a primary service, our primary service as its unique identifier, and then we just have a catch for errors in case something goes wrong. What advertising start actually does is it calls that create primary service method. That's the other event we need to listen to. So once we hear that event, we create our primary service. And that's it for the powered on state. If the state is anything else but powered on, so we close the script, uh, something happens, there's an error, then we stop the button characteristic, we stop advertising so that the Bluetooth device is no longer visible, and we clear all of our intervals, reset everything back to scratch so that we can try again. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much all there is to building a lightsaber. Except I know you all didn't come to listen to me today talking for 35 minutes about how I built it. You all really came so I could show you my lightsaber. So um, I'm going to see how this works. Not sure if it's going to work very well online, but here is the lightsaber. And because, so I bought this last year and I would walk around the office with it. And one of the most common things people would ask me is, but what color is your lightsaber? Well, that's why we connected it to Bluetooth, right? Because it can be any color you want it to be. So if we connect to our lightsaber. <laughs> The chat is exploding here. <laughs> <laughs> Why is 
Sorry, my browser is being strange. <laughs> Let me just try to do it from my phone. <laughs> <laughs> what color should we make the lightsaber? Well, I see there's a lot of red, some purple, pink, yellow, but I think red is the preferred color at the moment. All right. Okay, let's try it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So as I said, Bluetooth is slightly dodgy technology and doesn't always change. Red. Change. There we go. And as I said earlier, we had a surprise option as well. Yes. Because everybody needs a unicorn lightsaber sometimes. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. All right, great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Really impressive for to see the result after all the obstacles and pitfalls. I guess you managed to to really explore all the deep holes that were to find. I get the impression here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, well done. Really nice demo. Lots of okay. kudos on the chat. Yes, Shevin, what are the questions that we had so far on the chat? Yeah, new, new questions on, on, on the chat. To my website, which is on the screen right now, it's gergana.dev, to the GitHub repo, as well as a few links to videos and uh, blog posts that I've written about the whole process. Yeah, I, I documented it quite well because it was quite difficult. So, so yeah, all yeah. of the components that I used are on there. Um, there's even a link to the 3D model that we used to print. Okay, cool. So all SDF files, everything just yeah. ready to redo it. <laughs> That's yeah. Awesome. So uh, the link, the link that uh, that uh, that we found for that actually is is quite useful. Um, the person who designed it actually goes through like the printing of it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So so it explains you know all the parts and things like that as well. So so it, it, if you're new, new to 3D printing, printing even. Okay. That's pretty cool. All right. Then, Shevin, any other questions on your side? <laughs> yeah, no, all, all good. Very impressive. Yes. We need to, to build one lightsaber. 
Yeah, yeah, we should reach out to the makers. So instead of now um, with with the um, flatten the curve, and I hope that they're gonna have a little bit more spare time now for uh, leisure and fun activities to probably need to reach out to our local uh, maker community and see what can be done in the different fab labs. So uh, it would you be should, pretty yeah. awesome that maybe oh, in, in uh, next year for the for the physical conference that running around in Jedi costumes, superhero style <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, know, mimicking uh, some fights. <laughs> You never know. Lord of the Sith, if somebody is showing up, I'm pretty sure it will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, also that you ran two sessions today. I think it was must have been uh, exciting, but also exhausting. It was great to have you um, on the developers conference. Uh, we, we're surely looking forward um, for next year that maybe there's a chance that when the conditions allow it that you come over to Mauritius. That would be really great. And um, yeah, otherwise, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank and you speak for having soon. me. It's, it was really nice and I look forward to some more of, uh, watching some more of the sessions. Pleasure, pleasure, my dear. Great. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Chevin, what was your uh, impression with this whole process? I mean, this sounded like an extreme adventure, actually. Yeah, I did not expect to see that today. It's quite impressive to build the lightsaber, and especially using Bluetooth technology. And uh, to see there are like Bluetooth node libraries interacting via the browser communicating to to the lightsaber with the device i think that's 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 impressive yeah yeah absolutely i mean uh, it's really really interesting to see about the the different components how it then is, is bolted together what are the um, unexpected surprises that you just run into and uh, but i like the the tinkering spirit that comes through and then also there's this commitment come on it can be done let's resolve it mm -hmm. uh, even that you might have been uh, guided in the wrong directions by online tutorial which can happen with some magical tutorials you know where it's like follow step one two three and then you're done with step five and in between there's a lot of stuff missing so no i mean awesome stuff and um, yeah it was really impressive yeah i'm seeing many of the comments in the chat right now saying that next year we need to show the audience how to build the millennium <laughs> falcon <laughs> yeah gerald you're most welcome to start the printing already <laughs> well it depends on on which uh, on which um, ratio we go for i mean if it's like a like a 1 to to 120 or something it might be quite feasible if i'm not mm -hmm. completely off the range but yeah then um, yeah. see you soon, stay tuned.